Hi, this is Brother Richard, and today again we are looking at a lesson series, Prototokus Mystery. This will be part 256, and we are continuing in the series, The Kingdom Gospel. This will be part 4. We're looking at a principle dealing with judgment. We are entering into a period now of unparalleled judgment that's going to fall on the human race. But scripture teaches when God pronounces a judgment on the wicked, mm -hmm. he always protects the righteous. I'm going to repeat that. When God pronounces a judgment on the wicked, he always protects the righteous. Turn to Genesis 19, verses 15 to Here we have the judgment that's about to fall on Sodom and Gomorrah. And of course, the scripture lets us know that uh, the Lord, YHVH, is going out of his way to find any righteous in the city. And if there was a minimum number of righteous, he wouldn't even judge the city. But we find that that's not the case. So, <clears throat> he determines that they're gonna, he's going to wipe out the cities, the whole plain. But he's sending two angels to rescue the righteous. Pick it up, verse 15. And when the morning arose... Then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, while he lingered, he couldn't bring himself to leave this place. <clears throat> while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand, and upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him, and they brought him forth and set him without the city. So literally, they have to forcibly remove these people from uh, what's about to take place. So that raises the question. Lot knows the temperament of the people of that city. Mm -hmm. He tells them at one point, take my daughters, leave these two men alone. So he understands perfectly how the... Why is he lingering and why do you need to be dragged? Luciferian influence. You're seeing the Luciferian influence. That was their life. Their life was in the city. Hmm. And it was so interwoven, even though the scripture says that they were miserable. Hmm. It says that what Lot had to deal with every day, literally uh, <clears throat> brought... Uh, a, a feeling of wretchedness to his very soul. He aborted, it, but yet and still the Luciferian influence is so strong. Mm. They didn't participate in the sin. Had they done so, they'd have gone down with the city. Sure, sure. But they were so completely connected to it, <clears throat> they couldn't pull away from it. Would you describe what you've just told us? to be similar to the harlot city making men drunk with wine. The wine, of course, being, um, how do it described? It's um, sorcery, basically. Sorcery, right. Is this happening at that time? No, what's happening is what you're dealing with now. People are caught up in the subtlety 
of the evil of this current order, mm. they can't detach themselves from it. But that's a, 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 the point I'm trying to get to is that a sorcerer is being employed by the disappearance against the Adamic man. Yeah, but that that sorcery of the Harlot City is different. It's a whole different thing. You have the kings and the women and they're doing something, okay. manipulating. What you're looking at here is the darkness element. Right. And the subtlety of the influence that it has on man's inner being. Mm. Their life is caught up in the world's system to the point that they can't totally detach themselves from it. Right. So then this is proof, perfect proof, that if, and I'm talking about today, a born-again Christian is not pursuing these truths, these very truths that the Lord has chosen to give us at this time, and is 100% committed in doing so, you wouldn't be any different from Lot, even though Lot is righteous. Yeah, well, what it means is that uh, they're going to uh, experience uh, grief sure. uh, because of the inability to make the break mm. in what's happening. Well, you see what happened with Lot's wife. Yeah. They, the angels literally <clears throat> take him out of the city physically and they tell him, okay, now flee. And they're, you know, taking their time. Oh, can we go to this city over here? Oh, you know, that, that, this, this intransigence in wanting to leave. Well, it's giving us the understanding of the mindset of the human individual as it pertains to the world's system. Yes. They're so connected, they've been so programmed by the Luciferians to assume that the, the relationship that they have, the identity that they have with this corrupted, degenerate, fallen, worthless in the sight of God, pseudo-reality, mm -hmm. they can't detach themselves from it. It takes an act of the will. Sure which only a few really reach that point when they begin to see it for what it is right. and it's such a detestation they say I don't want any part of that I'm out of here yeah. you know? yes. so that's interesting what you just now brought up the point I'm trying, I was going to bring up the whole thing is that Lot and his wife and his daughters are living in an area where there's blatant homosexuality and, and bestiality who knows all that stuff and I guess, well, Sodom, Gomorrah, they were both, they had, I, they're similar in, their, in the nature of, of actions that are happening. Sure. So maybe that's the environment that the girls are being brought up in. Yes, sure. Um, but sure. what you're bringing out is the normalization of what we're seeing today. Look at all this madness. They're teaching two and three year olds exactly what you've just described. So that as, when they come to the point where they can actually understand what they're looking at, hey, that's normal. Well, I wanted to get to another point, Mr. Jones. I hope you don't mind me doing this. But we're talking about the same thing that we're talking about. So Lot and his wife and his daughters, they go. And then the daughters say, well, um, what about our progeny? You know, we, we need to keep, keep the, uh, whatever Lot's last name was, going. So they decide to lay with their own father to perpetuate the, the longevity of the, you know, so Mr. Jones, it's like, it, they have already become part of where their, their existence, but mm -hmm. I believe back in those days it was a little bit different. I think families, the concept of families, and you know, is, was different than it is now. Can you give us an explanation? Well... The, the, the understanding of the relationship between the father and the mother and the children is, was laid out by YHVH from a godly perspective. But what happened was when they detached themselves from the godly mode of operation of living life, Lot pitched his tent towards Sodom, it says. He began to get the influence of Sodom. Instead of fighting it, he embraced it. Mm -hmm. Not only did he pitch his tent towards Sodom, he wound up staying at the gate of Sodom. So it was a, a, a consistent progression into evil influence. 
And why is YHVH not taking, you know, telling them, hey, you gotta, the neighborhood's not good, you gotta move on down the street? Well, he's supposed to know that himself. Uh, Abraham was right there. Abraham saw everything. Lot knew what he was doing. But the influence was so subtle that he yielded to it rather than fight it. And ultimately, he wound up consuming him. He didn't go into sin, but it corrupted his family to the point he lost his wife, his daughters were degenerates, and you no, know, so what do you got to show for it? Nothing. Same thing is happening here. People compromising all the time. Uh, evil. What happens is when a person initially confronts evil, they see it for what it is. When that happens, you have a choice. You oppose it, get away from it, or you become allured by it. That's what happened with Sunday. The difference between Abraham and, and, and Lot was that Abraham never once yielded to that influence. Nor did he allow his family. He kept his distance. Lot didn't. So, <clears throat> the scripture is letting us know here that even though this has happened, this is an example of a righteous individual. Lot, when he died, he went into Abraham's bosom. Because his, 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 his soul was, was righteous. The rest of him was corrupted to the point that he couldn't distinguish normality beyond a certain point. Getting back to our principle, when there's a judgment that falls, God always spares the righteous. Turn to Revelation, I mean, turn to Ezekiel 9, verses 1 to 4. Ezekiel 9, verses 1 to 4. Now, what happens here is the Lord, YHVH, takes Ezekiel and he shows him the detestable things that are happening back in Jerusalem. Things that are happening in the temple. <clears throat> uh, people in, uh, bowing to pagan gods, doing despicable things in an area that is supposed to be sanctified, set aside for God's use. The priests totally corrupting themselves. The ancients entering into sin, habits of uh, detestation. And so he gets through giving Ezekiel a tour of all of this. And then he tells him something in verse 9. He says, I'm going to judge this thing. I'm going to wipe it out. Chapter 9, verses 1 to 4. He cried also in mine ears with a loud voice, saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near, even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand, and the men... <coughs> and one man among them was clothed with linen with a writer's inkhorn by his side. And they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. Now, this is, Ezekiel is seeing all this in the spiritual realm. And these men that have been called are angels. They're not human. They have been put in positions of guardians over the city. The destroying weapons were basically for the enemy that would try to come in and infiltrate or destroy the city. That was their job as sentinels to guard the city. Well, what YHVH is saying here is that he's going to turn these sentinels against the inhabitants of the city as a judgment on them. 
Verse 3, And the glory of God, the God of Israel, was going up from the cherub upon, whereupon he was to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's ink on by his side. This is a recording angel. The Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city. You go through the midst of the city, <coughs> through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the far ends of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. So what he's doing, <coughs> he's setting out to protect the righteous. They put a mark on the foreheads of the, those that are abhorrent to the things that are taking place around them. That the detestations are so egregious to them that they uh, some literally break down and cry. So the unrighteous are the ones who are marked? No, the righteous are the, the ones, ones who are marked. Okay. The mark is a protection for them mm -hmm. when the judgment falls. And <clears throat> he tells them, you, you, you put a mark on every one of them so that when the judgment falls, they're going to be protected. <clears throat> Verse 5, And to the others, he said in mine hearing, Go ye after him, through the city, smite, that your eye... Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children, women. But come not near any man upon whom is the mark. And begin at my sanctuary. So justice, judgment, falls on the house of God first. And then it goes forth. And what's happening here is when this judgment falls, all the righteous are going to be protected. Protected supernaturally. We see this as a recurring theme. When judgment falls, the righteous are always going to be protected. Turn to Revelation 7, verses 1 to 3. Revelation 7, verses 1 to 3. <coughs> And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. He cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Again, judgment falls on the unrighteous, the righteous are spared. Now, speaking of this coming judgment, turn to Zephaniah, second chapter. Zephaniah, the second chapter. Verses 1 to 3. <clears throat> gather yourselves together, yea, gather together, O nation not desired. Before the decree bring, bring forth, before the day pass as a chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. He keeps using the word before, before, 
before. He's telling you, pay attention. Do this before the judgment falls. <clears throat> Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth. He's not just talking to Israel. He's talking to the human race. Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. So he's saying everybody, the whole human race, stands in judgment. Everybody. But those that have made themselves, taken the opportunity to incorporate the exclusion clause, that which the judgment will not fall upon them, he's giving this decree to. <clears throat> Seek ye the Lord, all ye make of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness. Seek meekness. It may be you shall be hid, protected, in the day of the Lord's anger. The Lord is going to protect the righteous. The judgment is going to fall on the unrighteous, the wicked, the evil, of the whole human race. Simultaneously. <clears throat> so here again, the warning goes forth. Here again, he's saying, avail yourself of God's mercy. God's judgment is always tempered with mercy. Okay. Can you reiterate, as you did yesterday, what each unrighteous person hears at that point? Turn to Jeremiah 25. Verse 30. Therefore prophesy thou against them all these words. Notice what he says <coughs> verse 29. I'm going to just read the last part. I, for I will call for a sword upon all the inhabitants of the earth, saith the Lord of hosts. Against all. When he says all, he's meaning all. This is in YHVH who's judging a region. This is Elohim, the creator of the whole creation, signaling out the human race for judgment. Verse 30, therefore prophecy thou against them, who, the human race, all these words. Say unto them, the Lord shall roar from on high, and utter his voice from his holy habitation. He shall mightily roar upon his habitation. He shall give a shout as they that tread against all the inhabitants of the earth. So what is being said here is... The Lord is going to speak from His throne in New Jerusalem. He's looking, it says, He keeps talking about His habitation, His habitation. In other words, He's looking at the human race on the planet Earth. He's looking at every single individual, knowing what every single individual has done, and He's angry. He is angry, not just angry, He is in a rage. And when it says roar, it's talking about making a pronouncement against each single individual because of the transgressions that each individual has accomplished. You thief. You hypocrite. <coughs> you uh, uh, murderer. He's going to pronounce the judgment against every single individual. Yes. I, I expect that you're talking about born-again Christians as well. Yes. Okay. Yes. So the 
the paying for our sins that Jesus did, who is now doing this judgment thing, how does what he did then <coughs> make anything different? Or how does that work for the judgment that's being called upon them? Because when he looks at the human race, he looks at it in judgment. When he makes his pronouncement, it's going to be about upon those that don't have the blood covering. He's not talking to the born again. Oh, okay. All right. Let because me... he's got no case against the born sure. again. Sure. They're already yeah. forgiven. Exactly. Thank you. So the born again who chooses to do absolutely nothing from the point that he's born again, mm -hmm. continues stealing, continues murdering, whatever it was that he was doing, are you saying that he's covered? No, I'm saying he's nullified his covering. Oh. Uh, right, so okay, he's a foolish virgin at that point. But how does that? No, no, no. He's not a foolish virgin. No, he's, he's not, not a virgin, virgin at all. At all. No, he's, he's corrupt. At all. He's corrupt. We're talking about <coughs> somebody going through the born again experience and then believing that that's the destination. They can continue living the same old life they've lived before and continue being nonsensical in other words. People walk around telling me they're born again Christians. They live exactly the same as they did, still smoking meth, still running up and down with, you know, all of that stuff. Okay. So I just want to nail that. He's, he's, the judgment is going to fall those on those carnal Christians. Right. Carnal Christian. Turn in Rome is the eighth chapter. Just before he goes to Rome is the eighth yeah. chapter. Mm. Each person who hears, I'm talking about the unrighteous now, the judgment pronounced upon them. Do they hear the whole litany of things that they've done, or is this just, he only says one thing? No, they're going to hear everything, but it's not just hearing. Right, it's feeling. What they're going to do is experience a judgment as a result of the things they have done. When God speaks, he's not speaking words. He's speaking realities. He's speaking conditions upon people who have transgressed. The point I'm making is that the proclamation is the judgment. Yes. And the conditions follow the proclamation. Yes. The pro proclamation. When the word speaks, right. the condition comes into okay. being immediately. So back to the, the question. If somebody is guilty of doing eight things, just for example, which are, you know, are terrible, does that person hear all of those eight things? Or does the, does the Father, does the Lord just say, you're judged? The person hears. And what he hears, he's going to experience a judgment for the eight things he's right. done. Right, right, okay. Everything is going to be covered right. in that respect. Okay, Romans the eighth chapter. People like to play games with God. They do. And that's dangerous. Romans 8 verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. It is conditional. Right. People think they have a, 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 a free ride, a free ticket because they said a prayer uh, of uh, contrition or whatever it is of, uh, of uh, being guilty 10 years ago and uh, they think that's enough to get them in and get them through whatever is needful. That's a mockery to God. <clears throat> because when you pray and ask the Lord for forgiveness because you know you have sinned and you know what the destiny, your destiny is and you confess your sin, the scripture says believe in your heart, the Lord has saved you confess and you shall be saved you are saved at that point but what does that mean? that means that you are, don't have a free carte blanche uh, ticket to go back into sin exactly Go back into sin, drop down to verse <coughs> 6. To be carnally minded is death, 
but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. A person lives carnally, that is, after the senses, after the the intellect, after the emotions, they're living death. Yes. And if a person is living death, he's open to judgment, wide open to judgment. It probably is obvious, but the, the word repentance comes to mind as we're, te as we're learning this from you, but I don't see it mentioned here. I mean, of course, if you're sinning, you know you're sinning, okay? So you should stop sinning and then beg for forgiveness and all this stuff, but is there ever a, a mandate that you, for a period of time, you have to have repented? No. Repentance is immediate. <clears throat> Repentance is just changing your lifestyle. It means you admit you've been going the wrong way. You've been egregiously offending God through sin. Now you're going to live a life that's pleasing to Him. So let's say you repented and you legit legitimately repented, and then you fall back into that same sin. Mm -hmm. And then... Uh, you understand that you need to repent again, so is it okay to repent again, or you know, how many times can you do that before... You repent one time. Okay, exactly. That's what one I time. You fall back, you backslide. You backslide, God has a method for that individual. You confess. When you confess, you're reinstated. So you don't have to repent of anything. You just get up and keep walking the way you started walking originally. However, having said that, the person who does that many times, from my perspective, slides down the level of heaven that they would have received had they not repented. Sure, sure. Uh, you have you pay a price. Sure. But the idea is <clears throat> being reconciled. It, God has made it so that if a person strays, he has a way in which he can go back and continue on the path that God had ordained for him. You could apply the 490 times to, you understand what I'm talking about, you know, to, to that situation, couldn't you? Because since the Father has, excuse me, since the Lord has given his life, his blood, his flesh, that covers, I think, many instances of, sure. you know, somebody backsliding. In perpetuity, God looks at the heart. Right. A person can fall, genuinely, genuinely want to be restored, God will restore him. Right. So that's the case, genuine. Genuine. Yes. You could do it a thousand times if right. it's genuine. God right. will just don't go along with it. But people play games with God. Well, I'm going to do this knowing God's going to forgive me. Right. <laughs> and you're walking on thin ice. Yeah. Someone who is genuine probably wouldn't be using up a thousand times. No. No. But let's go on. So we see judgment falling, being pronounced on the whole human race. Those that are hid, protected, don't come under anything having to do with what the others are going to experience. So at that point, the human race is going to split into two basic camps. I'm talking about Christians, particularly. The unsaved are under judgment. That's it. There's no choice that they have. Christians have a choice. When the judgment falls, they're going to experience egregious hardship. But they have an opportunity because they have the Spirit dwelling in them to do the right thing. Turn to Matthew 24. Okay. Verse 12 and 13. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. People are going to become offended. If you can uh, imagine a person thinking he has a right to be offended, people are going to put themselves in the judgment seat blame God because in their own eyes this shouldn't be happening to them. And 
because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved, delivered. So what is this saying? It's saying that the person is caught up in this stuff, and he rationalizes, it's been a fool, and now he wants to deal genuinely with the Lord. <clears throat> in that respect, he's still going to have to endure quite a lot. But if he continues to endure, he's going to ultimately be delivered. That's what the word <coughs> say means. Let's take the Matthew 24, partially committed, saint, at the point that he's hearing the voice. What happens then? Oh, it's too late then. Right, okay. So, yeah, the judgment. So the Zephaniah 2, uh, 2 and 3 that we just read had to have kicked in way before for that to happen. Yeah, he keeps saying. Prophet keeps saying, oh. before, before, before this, you better get right. Before this, you better evaluate your situation right. and be under the graces of God by the time this happens. Because if this happens, you're under judgment. I think it's fair to say that if somebody was non-committed in the way that I'm thinking, they're not going to be reading Zephaniah 2. No. Two no well, they're, they're going to be in the same camp as regular unsaved exactly. people. Exactly the point. And, uh, you know, that's it. But this is this one group. Mm. And this is this group. They're going to be floundering and they're going to be stumbling and falling and um, being martyred. And going through, you know, the results of their own ineptitude. They didn't hear when they should have heard. And therefore they suffer the consequences of not being alert, being ready. But then you have the other group. Luke 21, verse 35 to 36. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell in the face of the whole earth. When it says a snare, what it means basically is it's, it's a, a trap, a net. And the people that are going to be in the snare, in this trap, in this net, are going to be in it as a result of the judgment that has been pronounced upon them. Their own lifestyle is going to ensnare them, entrap them, and ultimately destroy them. That's why the scripture says, he that will save his life will lose it. He that will lose his life for the gospel's sake will save it. It's the life. Remember what we just read about Lot. Their life, they were living in Sodom, is what destroyed them. Lot's wife could have walked free and been, uh, you know, the, the, the matriarch that would have made the difference between what his daughters did and didn't do, sure. changed the destiny of all, you know, nations. She's caught up in her life to the point where she couldn't extricate herself and pay the price. It's the life that's going to be the snare for people who are not willing to totally commit while they had the chance. Totally commit means totally cut off. Sure. I'm not sure everyone fully understands that. Well, basically what people think is, oh, you got to give up everything. You got to, if you're rich, you got to, you know, walk around in rags and holes in your sandals and that stuff. No, that's not what that means. It doesn't mean you have to give up anything. It means you have to be willing to give it all up. Willing. That's the big difference. Abraham was willing. Job was willing. These were men that had much wealth. But they had something that was more important to them than their wealth. That was their relationship with Elohim. <clears throat> so what's being said here? 
as a snare shall it fall on those of the whole human race. Verse 36, Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Now if you're worthy to escape, you're not going to be in that group that's struggling in the snare. You're going to be in the group that's free. What are you going to be doing as a result of being counted worthy to escape? This is what we want to focus on. What you're going to be doing, <clears throat> turn back to Matthew 24, 14. Matthew 24, 14. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, then shall the end come. The gospel is going to be heard. First you have the judgment, then you have the gospel. Everybody is going to receive both, with the exception of the righteous hearing the judgment. They're going to hear the gospel. The unsaved are going to hear the gospel. Everybody's going to hear the gospel. It's going to be central. Nobody's going to be left out. When that happens, those that are accounted worthy to escape all these things. Turn to Revelation 5th chapter. Verse 9. <clears throat> and then he sung <coughs> a new song. Who sung a new song? We will see. Saying, Thou art worthy to take the book. Open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Every kindred and tongue and people and nation on the face of the earth has heard the gospel. These are the ones that have received it. <coughs> they've received it. They've accepted it. But they haven't been taught it. They don't have a clue about the kingdom principles. All they have done at this point is enter into the kingdom. That's what anybody does and here's the gospel. You enter into, you become born again, cleansed by the blood. Then you have to be discipled. You have to be trained. You have to be taught what the kingdom is, how it affects you and your place in it. These, this specific group in Revelation 5, of these Priests or elders? Elders. Are there no more priests? Sure. I'm talking about, of course, a very low level, but are they still not, are there still priests on the earth? Uh, yeah, but what we're looking at here now deals with when the gospel is preached, mm. who hears it, and what happens. Okay. This group, out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation hear it, they receive it. They are now all born again but they have to be taught the principles that's where the teachers come in that's where the one <coughs> turned around back to Matthew 24 Verse 45 and 46. <clears throat> Who then 
is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season. Give who meat in due season? The Oops. people that have just heard the gospel. They got to be fed. They got to be taught. All they know is what they've just heard, the kingdom message, which is what Jesus preached. He said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay, I repent. I want it, Lord. What did we, what'd he do immediately? He go in the temple and he start teaching about what he just got through preaching. Yes. Okay, in order for them to say, yeah, I heard that, now I want a bit more, that means that they are in the gathering. They're not in the gathering yet. They're heading toward the gathering. Gathering has to take place. This is the judgment, the gospel preached. The gathering is down here. Okay. You can't gather people that aren't open to receive so the what the gathering is. By who? Angels. The council call. Remember, we have a lesson on it. The angels preach the gospel to the whole human race after the judgment falls on them. And you, and you, and me are given the XY access to go and feed them right. now. So this is just off the beginning of sorrows. Yes. Mm. This is during the beginning of sorrows period. The kingdoms have fallen. Right. Everything is in a state of chaos. Out of this chaos, Israel is being brought to the land. <coughs> <coughs> the faithful and wise servant is raised now to feed God's sheep. Well, the point I think he was making was those who have heard it and said yes, now they need to be fed. Yes. For them to get to the gathering, because the gathering has not yet happened, they still have to be protected somehow. Sure. Which I think is the point yeah. that he was making. Sure. So we understand, therefore, that from the beginning of sorrows until the gathering itself, the Lord still keeps his hand, obviously, over those who will become the elders. Certainly. The Certainly. What does that look like? That's Ephesians, the second chapter. While we were sinners, yet God because of his great love. Okay. The, the place has already been right. there. Right. It's a Everything is prepared. <clears throat> the, 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 the pieces are now falling in place to culminate God's master plan for his sons. After the <clears throat> rapture, so we're talking about the beginning of the tribulation now, mm -hmm. all those who have the Holy Spirit in them are born again, who will obviously be martyrs, how many of them will be elders and how many will, will be priests? Or what percentage will be elders, what percentage will be priests? You're talking about the ones that are left behind? Yes. yes. Oh, the majority of them are going to be elders. Okay. But some will Overwhelming be Overwhelming majority, yeah. yeah. Right. Let me ask you a question on my brother's behalf. Mm -hmm. I'm going to answer before I ask the question and then he'll know what I'm talking about. Just before the gathering is my answer. The question is, Mr. Jones, when is it that you aren't going to be teaching him and me anymore? When is it? Yeah. He said just before the gathering. Remember that. <laughs> now, let's hear the, the real answer. It's dependent upon each one's level of growth. He's wriggling. No, I'm not wriggling. You I'm don't want to hear any giving wriggling. you as much you as that. That's true for part. everybody. Okay. We grow to a point, we reach that point, and Paul talks about that, where <clears throat> you're holy now, are focused on the Holy Spirit, not an outside individual. <coughs> but, but, there's more. Okay. Yes. The, the, uh, the way that the Lord has constructed <coughs> the prototokis hierarchy, mm -hmm. you're going to have, like, if you take the difference between the pillar angel right. and the, the angel that's at the altar. Okay. who was a martyr on earth. Right. Now he's 
at the at the at the altar doing no the pillar angel is going to be his teacher why because he's on a higher stature it's dependent upon each individual okay let me back up a little bit for okay his question since the beginning of sorrows is the graduation of the Matthew 24 verse 45 teacher does that teacher require to be taught outside of the Holy Spirit from that point on? No. Okay. No. So then the answer, he, he, which he said was, before the gathering. Uh, I would say, <clears throat> before, um, for the most part, yes. Just before the gathering. Because, that's when you're going to get your entourage. Okay. You're going to be. We're going to be in a different reality. We're going to be relying upon the Holy Spirit. So, but yeah. really, it's the being of sorrows is, is really what we should be saying. Yes, because that's when the change takes place, mm. and that's when everybody comes into his own. At that point, do you expect? To... We already know the answer. I'll save that for another time. <laughs> <laughs> Did even us hanging here? I think so. Yes. yes. <laughs> Okay, we're almost through. Praise the Lord. Not that we're almost through. <laughs> we're trying to fit the pieces together here. <clears throat> we see two groups after the judgment. One trying to survive, going through what they're going through. my Christians here. The other group being given the positions of preparing God's sons for the gathering. Gospel is preached. Everybody hears the gospel. Turn to Matthew 28. What do you do when you hear the gospel? Verse 19. <clears throat> Go you therefore and teach all nations. What are you going to teach them? What they've heard from the gospel. Do you describe that as the whole counsel of God? Yes, because he goes on to say that in verse 20. Okay. Go you therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, teaching them, teaching them, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever right. I have commanded you. Right. And lo, I'm with you always. So, yes. <clears throat> Baptizing them. Yeah. We'll be able to baptize them in the Holy Spirit? Hmm, baptize them in water. That's what I thought. The Holy, the, the Holy Spirit is the one who baptizes them into the water. Right. Mind. Okay, I just wanted to make sure of that clarification. Just, yeah. Mm -hmm. I had to ask it. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't believe this will change. I believe it will be the same thing. In that new reality? Yeah. The baptizing in water mm -hmm. to represent the There's a declaration that yeah. they're now born okay. again. You don't see any, any difference or any change in that? No. Will it be more than is being done now? Every single person. Okay. Which will, which will willingly uh, yield to that. So yeah. when will the being taught group receive the fullness same time that we do at the glorification the glorification <clears throat> the teachers receive their reward at the gathering right the students at the gathering are going to be prepared for the rapture the rapture is where everybody gets glorified mm -hmm. right do you imagine that more people will be coming out at the time of that new reality to be in Christ than before new reality. Yes. And so therefore we will be baptizing in water a lot more. That's really where I was going. Yes. Okay. Yes. So during the gathering, the teaching will be primarily for the called before the foundation of the earth or primarily of those that are called after the foundation of the earth. Before the foundation of the Predestinated earth. Predestinated. Okay. The ones that were called after, this has been their time. Right. Oh, really? 
Sure. Oh, of course, because they need more time to, to, to understand. Oh, I'm going to give you a scripture to yes. prove that. Okay. Then we'll close with that. Okay. Galatians, <clears throat> third chapter. Mm. Galatians, the fourth chapter, verses four to five. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law. <clears throat> Why? Two things. Verse 5 is explaining two separate principles. To redeem them, them that were under the law. Who is the them? Those who have the temporal calling. He uses the word them, that we, so you see two different groups here, that we might receive the adoption of sons. So the 2,000 year period has been for <coughs> those who have the temporal calling. The period of the gathering to the rapture for the sons of God that have the eternal call. The pre Interesting. Now, coming back to my original question, is it done that way around because those who have the temple calling need more time? Sure. As in significantly more time. Significantly, yes. Mm. What it was, God's original plan was <clears throat> to have the church continuously there so that they could avail themselves of it. The communal system <coughs> system of prophets and apostles to train them give them the understanding of what they need to qualify for the prototokos uh, 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 position so you're talking about just elders when you say uh, the before the foundation of the earth group yes and the predestinated group, you're talking about elders. Yes. Okay. Yes. So then, it's true to say that there are elders being taught today, right now, mm -hmm. because they are um, temporally called. Yes. But there must be very, very few of them. Very few. Oh, yes. 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 You can probably count them on yeah, one hand. You can see how abrasive it is on the nature of Adamic individuals. Mm -hmm. They don't want it. Sure. They don't gravitate toward it. Yes. You know, Mr. Jones, I have to believe there are other groups besides ours. Of course. Sure. If there's somebody in the group that can answer all the questions that can be asked. So if you're not asking questions that you need the answer to, it's your own fault. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it, to me, it's acquiescing to a Luciferian influence. Mm. If you wanted, if somebody had a check with your name on it, and the check was a million dollars in their pocket, you know, you couldn't see it, but you knew that that person had something for you, you wouldn't hesitate to inquire and get as much information about that, how you can get it as possible. Because you value what is in right. the offing. Right. I think you do a bit more than inquire. <laughs> yes. And Jonesy, what comes to me is the scripture that says, <clears throat> work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Amen. Meaning you don't let anything go by that you have paid attention to or been run nudged to notice. And you do no inquiry, no seeking, no no asking, then you settle for what you get. Most Christians today remain ignorant of what they profess they believe in. Yeah. That's why Muslims don't have respect for Christians. <clears throat> That's why most Christians appear to be ignorant to intellectuals. They are. Because an intellectual looks at a Christian as though he's some kind of a primitive mentality. They can't stand the heat. In uh, you know, why should I? Why should I 
embrace your belief, you don't even know what you believe in, an intellectual would say. Yeah. A Muslim would say, you hypocrite, you don't live what you're telling exactly. me I should live. Exactly. So, you know, that the whole thing is, is, a, is a, <clears throat> a shame, a stain upon the name of Jesus. But that's all going to change.